Hello guys, welcome to PHU Biology. My name is Matt and um, we'll be discussing the digestive system today. Uh, due to how long this lesson could be, we're going to split it up into two parts. So obviously today we'll be starting with part one. Um, so we'll be following a simple meal that consists of a bit of protein, starch, and some lipids. Um, so how about a nice steak for some lipids and proteins, uh, some mas mashed potatoes for starch, and maybe some broccoli just for fun. We'll get to broccoli's function uh, in the digestive tract a little bit later. So anyways, of course, digestion begins right in the mouth. Before you even place any food into your mouth, these salivary glands begin to secrete saliva, which is the first component of chemical digestion. You'll, you won't have to worry about the specific names of these glands, uh, so we'll just refer to all of them as the salivary glands. So obviously these produce saliva, and saliva is rich in an enzyme called salivary amylase. But this will only break down starches in the mouth as you chew. Uh, chewing, of course, uh, occurs in the mouth, and it's the first part of mechanical digestion versus chemical digestion. Um, to chew, you'll be using your teeth, tongue, and even your cheeks to break down large masses of food into a small mass of food that we call a bolus. Once everything's chewed up, the tongue will throw the, the bolus into the back of the mouth to be swallowed. And that'll bring us to the next structure on the next slide, which is the pharynx. So here you see two images of the same region of your body that we like to call the pharynx. Once you swallow a bolus, it immediately enters the pharynx, but this tube is also used for oxygen transfer when breathing. So the body does a little bit of organizing here with a structure called the epiglottis to make sure that your bolus doesn't go down your trachea into your lungs, which would cause you to choke and maybe even suffocate and die. So um, in order to do so, the epiglottis will tip down, as you can see right here uh, in the image on the right, so that it stops any, uh, any mass of food from going down the trachea, which is this tube back here. So it'll force all your bolus down here and it'll hit right there, that's the uh, upper esophageal sphincter. So that'll force everything down the right tract. When you're breathing over here on the left, the epiglottis will actually tip up and the pharynx will allow oxygen to go down here. And simultaneously, your upper esophageal sphincter will close, not allowing much air to go in there either. So that's it for the pharynx. We'll move on to the next structure, as you can see from this image, it'll be the esophagus. So the esophagus is the column that the bolus descends through in order to get into the stomach, which is down here at your left. All right, so a series of muscle contractions within the smooth muscle lining of the esophagus allows for the pressing down of the bolus right through this tract. These involuntary con contractions and relaxations, rela relaxations of muscles along the esophagus in order to move a bolus of food down the esophagus is called peristalsis. That'll be an important term. So that's basically these muscles all around the esophagus pushing a bolus of down a, a bolus of food down your esophagus into your stomach. That's once again that's called peristalsis. Um, finally, it'll get to the bottom part of the esophagus um, and it'll meet this sphincter called the lower esophageal sphincter. And once it gets through there, we'll get into the next part of the digestive system, which is the stomach. So here you see an image of the stomach, except uh, we'll be focusing more on the outer layers of the stomach. So once the bolus is allowed through the lower esophageal sphincter, also referred to as the gastroesophageal sphincter, the stomach secretes acidic fluids that assist in digest the digestion of the bolus. Uh, we'll refer to these gastric juices as gastric, gastric juices or fluids. Also take note of the three labeled muscle types on the diagram. Uh, these, muscle, these muscles perform a vital role in digestion by churning food within the stomach to enhance digestion. So you get a maximum amount of surface area hitting those um, acids in order to digest most successfully. So the next slide will go into um, basically just zooming in 
to the stomach lining. Um, so we're still in the stomach, but we've zoomed in. And we're looking at we, what we call a gastric pit in your stomach. And it's basically infested with all, and your stomach is infested with all of these pits. Um, that's why there's so many folds in the skin, if you will, of your stomach. Um, this is what you'd see, basically, if you took a biopsy of a part of your stomach lining. So the gastric, com the gastric pit is composed of several types of cells, but we'll only focus on about three of these. The first will be the mucus cells, highlighted in red, right here. Those are the mucus cells. Pay attention to the spelling, by the way, because mucus cell is spelled with a, uh, an O right here. But mucus, which is actually what is secreted by these cells, is not uh, spelled with this O. It's just M-U-C-U-S. So that, that could show up on a test and maybe confuse a few people. Um, so these cells, of course, they simply secrete mucus. And this assists in digestion within the stomach and also develops a layer in the stomach called the mucosa layer. This layer protects the stomach from the very acidic acids within the stomach. They also help with digestion as well. Next, we have the chief cells, which are these pink cells over here. So these pink cells, we call them chief cells, are going to be working you know, hand in hand with the parietal cells. But we'll focus on the chief cells right now. Um, so these are responsible for secreting an enzyme called pepsinogen. Take heed that pepsinogen is actually an inactive enzyme. As you can see right here, pepsinogen is the um, product, if you will, of the chief cells, but it's inactive. When, when we refer to it as pepsinogen, it means that that enzyme is actually inactive. Pepsinogen requires HCl in order to assume its active form. So as you see, there's going to be some HCl produced, but we'll focus on how that happens a little later. Uh, when active, we call the enzyme pepsin. And um, so that is right here, the product of this reaction. Pepsinogen plus HCl will give us pepsin, which is the active, um, active enzyme in the stomach. Cheese cells also secrete gastric lipase, which is responsible for emulsifying or breaking down lip lipids. So another term you might want to jot down is emulsifying. Emulsifying is uh, basically the breakdown of lipids. Um, so... Let's, uh, let's rewind a little bit. We have these chief cells and they're doing their job. They've given us some uh, uh, pepsinogen, but the only problem is we need some of the HCl. So that brings us to our final cell within the, uh, the gastric pit, which is the parietal cell over here in yellow. And so this cell secretes the HCl necessary for producing pepsin out of pepsinogen, the inactive pepsinogen, if you... Um, uh, just to clarify on that. So uh, just a little recap on this um, because this is a majority of the material uh, that you'll be tested on uh, concerning the stomach. You have your chief cells which secrete pepsinogen. Again, pepsinogen is an inactive enzyme. Uh, it, in order to assume its active shape, it needs HCl and the HCl is actually secreted by the parietal cells. So um, this pepsinogen plus the HCl will give you pepsin, and pepsin is responsible for the breakdown of um, of proteins in the stomach. So a little um, a little information on pepsin is uh, that pepsin is active around pHs around 1.5 to 2.0, which explains its need for HCl to assume its active form. Its function again is to break down the polypeptides from the proteins in your steak into smaller polypeptides, not into its amino acid monomers, but only into smaller polypeptides. There are other enzymes that will be responsible for breaking down uh, your polypeptides into amino acids. Um, pepsin will not, uh, once again, pepsin will not break them into uh, amino acids. Um, and um, another secretion of the uh, stomach that you might want to might want to know is the uh, hormone called gastrin. Now this is secreted by a third, uh, a fourth cell that we uh, haven't discussed, and you most likely won't be tested on it. But it's called a G cell. So these G cells will secrete this hormone called gastrin. This hormone simply stimulates the production of more gastric acid. 
Um, and just take note that this process is an example of negative feedback because the presence of stomach acid reduces the secretion of uh, the hormone gastrin, therefore stopping the reaction. So you can see where the negative uh, feedback cycle is there. As we secrete more uh, gastrin, we receive more gastric juices, but the presence of these gastric juices will then shut down um, the production of the actual hormone itself and therefore shut down the production of gastric juices. So therefore negative feedback. Now finally your, your meal will remain in your stomach anywhere between two to five hours on average in order to ensure complete digestion. Um, take note that everything has to be completely liquefied before we can move into the next part of the GI track, which will be right here. Alright guys, hope you guys enjoyed the video. Please, if, if there are any questions or if you'd like to see any other topics on our channel, uh, leave a comment, subscribe so that you won't miss any of the videos. Again, this is Matt from PHU Biology. And I hope this was helpful.